the, the, the answer to, to um, just to, I want to give a spoiler for the end of this talk. The answer is surrender. Does what we started with it in this prayer, right? The answer at the end of this talk is the answer is going to be surrender. Um, so if you want to leave now, that's fine. You can come back in an hour. We'll have some praise and some prayer and some adoration. A um, couple things. Uh, where to start? I want, to, before I like launch into the, the topic for tonight, there's something about being in a room with y'all that uh, I mentioned it kind of this morning a little bit at Mass, but um, it's so humbling. I mean, truly, uh, to, um, to hear like so many people say, hey, uh, I, uh, I teach in high school and I use your stuff all the time. Or I teach religious ed and I use your stuff all the time, right? Have youth ministry and I use your stuff, or I'm a mom or a dad and I use, you know, my kids will listen to you on the screen, whatever. And there's something really humble about that. But the thing about that is, it's like it's one thing. Um, how do I say this? I will first. You're welcome. Uh, number two, <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna be gracious. But number two is, I'm I'm the one humble because it's one thing to sit in my living room and hit like record and then hit stop, and then upload something. It's another thing entirely to be in relationship with people. That's so difficult. It's messy, as you know. Like, it's not a straight line. A straight line is record. Hi, my name is Father. And then at the end, whatever. I'm praying for you. Pray for me. Like, that's super simple. That's really easy. What you're doing is the messy stuff. What you're doing, I'll say this, what you're doing is what matters, really. I mean, I, body of Christ, right? So eye, foot, ear, you know, the, you know that scripture. I'm paraphrasing, but <laughs> the brain cannot say through the appendix, I do not need you. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> but I'm really convinced of this, and, and it's, um, it's that I truly believe that the gospel is going to transform our culture once again. But it is not going to happen by the person holding a microphone. It's not gonna happen from a stage. It's not gonna happen with, on a billboard. It's gonna happen through two means. It's gonna happen through family and through friendships. That's how the gospel is gonna change the world. Like, once again, because that's how it happened in the first place, right? It was, it was through family and through friendships that, that, that Christ conquered the world. That, that the, the gospel reached out and transformed culture, and so, Again, it's fine to have these tools, and I'm so grateful that I get to be the person who says the stuff. But you're the ones who are making the difference. Because without you, so many people would never, ever hear the life-changing message of Jesus. So I'm grateful that I get to offer a tool, but I realize it's just a tool. That's one of the reasons why. Like, it's, it's, so, it's such an honor when I... So when, when y'all who are in the trenches are saying like, hey, thank you, because I'm like, well, at least you consider me one of you. You know what I mean? Sometimes it can be kind of... Sometimes. Gosh, sorry. No, it's just, it's just. Okay, sometimes it can be kind of isolating, you know? Sometimes it's kind of isolating. So thank you for... Like, let me be one of you. Same with the brother priests. Like, like they're like, hey, thank you for the stuff. I'm like, okay, at least you don't hate me. That's the fear, right? <laughs> so anyways, that's the first thing. You are the ones. So please, family and friendships. That's, that's where we need to put our energies. Um, relationships. This is the segue into the talk. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> On campus, I talk to a lot of work at UMB, University of Minnesota Duluth, and on campus, we talk a lot about relationships, obviously. And there are some relationships in life that we just all know this, right? There are some relationships in life that the more the merrier. So, like, we're all going out. Can I come along? Absolutely, the more the merrier. Um, when you have a roommate, like, you have a roommate, and, like, hey, we're going to get a third or a fourth because you have a big house. Absolutely. There are some relationships we have that are, like, they're, they're increased, they're magnified, they're amplified when you add more people to them. Like, sometimes a family's like that, right? So here's a kid, here's another kid, here's another kid. Like, there's more love to go around. It's kind of one of those great things. At the same time, we know that there are some relationships that don't tolerate rivals. Like, there's some relationships that actually are destroyed if you try to add another. One obvious one, marriage. 
Like, <laughs> because we know, right, we know that, that that's the kind of relationship that doesn't tolerate, tolerate the presence of rivals. In fact, a rival would destroy the relationship. That's the kind of relationship that a rival would destroy that kind of relationship. And the same thing is true when it comes to the Lord. And here's our God who, yeah, so many relationships are amplified, magnified. I remember hearing at one time someone said something like, uh, grief shared is grief divided. And joy shared is joy multiplied. So good. It's true. But some relationships don't tolerate rivals, the presence of rivals. And if we permit the presence of rivals, then we're literally dooming the relationship. Marriages, I can think of two. Marriage is one. Our relationship with Jesus is another. That's one of the reasons why from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, one of the commands, one of the main command, the, the, the primary commandment is what? I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Another way to say it is, I am the, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no rivals. There should be nothing in your life that is my rival. There should be nothing in your life that's my competitor. That when it comes down to it, it could be me or it could be the thing. And yet, the whole story of the Bible is not just a story of the other nine sins. The whole story of the Bible is a story of idolatry. The whole story of the Bible is a story that uh, every one of us falls into the trap of tolerating, if not creating, at least tolerating the presence of rivals in our lives. And so so let's, we're going to talk about idols tonight, obviously, because it's on the title of the thing. Um, but I think sometimes when we say the term idols, we think of, we think of the obvious things. Like the obvious idol is like, you know, don't, don't do idolatry. Like, okay, check. I don't have like a little statue of whatever in my house with a little incense going up to it. Like, blah, 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 blah. like you don't do that. Like, I'm fine. I don't, I don't have any idols. Or like this, that kind of thing. Like, I haven't based my life, I haven't, I haven't founded my life around some evil thing. The crazy thing is we often think that an idol is a bad thing. False. Very rarely do we make idols out of bad things. Very rarely do we make idols out of bad things. We almost always make idols out of good things. Because that's what an idol is. It is a good thing that we turn into an ultimate thing. An idol is a good thing that we've turned into an ultimate thing. An idol is a good thing that, yeah, even maybe it's supposed to be in our lives, but we placed it at the center, and we're willing to do anything to hold on to that thing, willing to do anything to serve that thing, willing to do anything to live for that thing. An idol is a good thing that we've made into an ultimate thing. And I don't agree on, with John Calvin on a lot, but a lot. But one of the things that John Calvin said is he said, this is all of our problems, not only in the Bible, but every one of us. He said the human heart is an idol-making factory. The human heart is an idol-making factory. And it's completely true. In fact, I mean, again, let's do the obvious ones first. The most obvious idols I think we find on a regular basis. In fact, uh, I saw this actually when I drove into town. Actually, most towns that I drive into or, you know, pass through, I noticed they have, most towns have 24-hour adoration, like all over the country. Almost every con town I've ever been in, of certain, you know, level people, they have 24-hour adoration. They have these places where any time of day or night, 24 hours a day, that's what that means. Um, you can walk up to a locked door, just dig in your pocket, pull out a keychain, a little fob on it, beep, scan the thing, unlocks the door, you walk in, and you 24-hour worship. The walls are lined with mirrors, and the high priests and high priestesses dress in spandex, and they tell you to spin faster, and to jump higher, and to sweat more, and to lift more weights. And we have 24-hour adoration, places where you and I can go any time of day or night and worship the body. We have this. Now, the body is a good thing, right? Or else you're going to have to come back for the Theology of the Body Conference. Yes, the body is a good thing, but an idol is not a bad thing. An idol is a good thing that we make into an ultimate thing. Another one, um, I mean, gosh, the last two years, how many of us, how many of us, the idol of security has been exposed? The idol that, that, that um, I need a guarantee has been completely revealed. In fact, I mean, just for crying out loud, we have, uh, 
one of the reasons why we have insurance. Insurance is because we know that if I give a heart to something, it can be taken away. So I'm going to put all this money down. Would you like the extended warranty and the this and that, the guarantee of this? Because yes, because if I pay for the extended warranty, if I pay for the guarantee, if I get that insurance, then you can't take this thing that I value away from me. Now, insurance isn't bad, obviously, but we don't make idols out of bad things. We make idols out of good things that we turn into ultimate things. And so the thing I need the most, the thing I need the most is I need to hold on to that security. And how many of us two years ago was like, man, at any given moment, it all can drop out. The bottom can completely drop out. And for a lot of us, for a lot of y'all, the bottom did drop out. What was certain? You recognize that certainty was an illusion. Because that's what we live under. We don't live in security. We don't live in certainty. We live under the illusion of security. We live under the illusion of certainty. So sometimes we need to break that idol. Or um, think about, I don't know, sometimes people, people make beauty into an idol. I remember, uh, in a really simple ways, I remember talking with a mom, one of my first assignments up in northern Minnesota, she had two daughters. She had two daughters. And, and one of the daughters was just super talented, really athletic, really funny, really beautiful. And this, and this other daughter, her second daughter, was kind of studious and, and just attractive, but just very plain compared to her sister. I remember her uh, sharing with me, she said, I'm just really worried about the second daughter because, you know, she's just not as beautiful as her older sister, which is, makes sense. It's fine. And I remember sharing with her, I said, actually, I'm not worried about the second daughter, your, your younger daughter, because she's figuring out who she is. I'm worried about your older daughter because right now she's athletic. Right now, she's accomplished. Right now, she's beautiful. At some point, that athleticism will be taken away. At some point, those accomplishments will fade. And at some point, the reality is her beauty will be gone. Your younger daughter is not, doesn't have the temptation to make her looks, her appearance, an idol. Your older daughter will have to figure that out. Who is she when her accomplishments are taken away? Who is she when her beauty begins to fade? We all know people like this. We might be people like this. Taking good, something good and making it into the thing that we live for, the thing we think about every single day, the thing that you think about when you look in the mirror like, ah, oh, mm, crow's feet, 11s, whatever those things are. <laughs> I want to say this too. Just so you know, there's a rumor that I dye my hair. I do not dye my hair. <laughs> this guy, someone emailed me and said, you need to stop dyeing your hair. It looks like shoe polish. And I was like, listen, buddy. I don't know why, but the hair on my face is very gray. It's, sorry, it's highlight, highlights. <laughs> the ones on the head, not yet, they're getting there. But that's the thing is the temptation, of course, is to take our health, our appearance, our security, our success, and make those into ultimate things. I mean, think about even in ministry. In ministry, one of the temptations is I want to have a significant ministry. Why? Because I want to serve the Lord. That's how it started. But now I want to have significant ministry because then it means I'm significant. I want to have successful ministry. Yes, because I want people to come to know Jesus. But I also want them to come to know Jesus through me. And so when someone else, they're like, have you heard about so-and-so? She's an incredible youth minister. Have you heard about this guy? He's like such a great religion teacher. You're like, runner, runner. yeah, they're fine. <laughs> it's one of, the ways, one of the ways in which, gosh, I mean, think about King Saul, right? We all know the story of King Saul, especially after David defeats Goliath and what happens. I mean, Saul at, at one point is celebrating David. He's like, yes, because David killed Goliath. You know, Goliath, you know the story. Goliath came out day after day, week after week, month after month, challenged all the armies of Israel. Saul was there. He didn't go out. He was willing to give David his armor. <laughs> yeah, son, go out there. And when David defeated Goliath, Saul rejoiced up until the moment when what happened? They were coming into the cities and they said, Saul has slain his thousands. That's pretty good, especially if you haven't done anything yet. 
Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. From that moment on, what happens? Saul becomes envious of David. And what's envy? And we, we probably know this already, but, but what is envy? Envy is one of those idols. Envy is one of those results of an idol, right? Envy is one of the results of the idols of significance. Envy is one of the uh, idols, a result of the idol of, of I want to be successful. Because why? And envy, I'll say this, envy is to jealousy as vandalism is to stealing. So uh, back when I was in high school, I remember being a senior in high school, right? It was the, the two days before my senior year started. And I, my, parent, my family was away. We came back to uh, our, my parents' home. I walked in the house, and I was like, something's weird. And someone had broken in the, the, the back door, and they had stolen some stuff. And we walked through the whole house. It was kind of creepy, you know? Someone broke into the house and stole stuff. But in one of the rooms, they didn't steal anything, but they broke a bunch of stuff. And my dad had said, you know what? I'm not mad at the fact that they stole stuff. I'm not happy about it. I'm not mad at the fact they stole stuff because here's someone who's in need, and they took something because they needed it. He says, I am really mad. And the fact that they just broke this, because they didn't do anything, right? It's just like, I don't want you to have this thing. That's what envy is like. Jealousy is that sense of like, oh, I want that too. It's, kinda, it's almost a positive thing. In fact, there are positive forms of jealousy. Like a husband who's jealous about his wife's heart. That's good. God who's jealous about our hearts. That's good. But envy is different. Envy is simply, I'm sad because People recognize you. I'm sad because you're happy. I'm sad because you have this great gift. I'm sad because your ministry has been successful. And I see myself as less than because of how God has used you. Does that make sense? So we have this idol of significance, which leads into this pain of envy, which leads to a place of just anger and resentment. I mean, how many times, how many, how many of us do we no, maybe even ourselves, who are, our, our ministry has been marked by resentment. Because I thought if I worked for the church, it'd be like this. I thought if I gave my life for the Lord, it'd be like this. But it's not like this. So I'm upset with the people who are recognized. And I'm upset with the Lord. I'm resentful at him because it's not what I thought it would be. So we experience this resentment, we experience this envy, we experience even this, this, this anger. Now, all of those, plus a bunch of others, right, are the obvious idols. Those are the kind of idols that if you looked at an examination of conscience, you'd be like, oh, yeah, 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 I got it, I get it. Again, plus like 10 or 20 or 100 more. Those are all obvious idols. But the title of this talk is not obvious idols. The title of this talk is, I think, subtle idols. Oftentimes, like the hidden idols, and the kind of subtle or kind of hidden idols that uh, strike me the most are not the kind where we turn away from God to another thing, but the kind where we turn God into another thing. Not where we turn away from God to another thing, but we take God and turn him into another thing. And there's four kind of ways that I want to kind of unpack how we typically do this, our, our, our idol-making factory hearts. One is, well, here they are, treating God like a toy, like a talisman, like a therapist, and like a twin. See, there's T's. T's are involved in all of them. Pedagogy. Um, so, <laughs> this all comes from the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, chapter 31, there's, a, there's, a, there's an account that just always strikes me as being just, you know, it's one of those things where you hear a story your entire life, and at one point, you hear it in a new way, and it's like marks everything you see from then on. This is Exodus 31, is, is, is 32, I mean, is one of those. <laughs> Exodus 31, plus one. Exodus 32 is the story of the golden calf. So we all know this story. And we know the, I knew the story like this. I knew the story that Moses goes up the mountain um, to receive the Ten Commandments. And he comes down, and the people of Israel are now worshiping the golden calf, that they've turned away from the Lord God, and they're worshiping now this golden calf, which is part of the story. But if we get down into the details of the story, it's <laughs> something I never noticed. So here's the golden calf. But how are the people of Israel worshiping? What are the people of Israel saying about the golden calf? Because I always thought, how stupid is this? How dumb is it that here's the Lord God who 
10 plagues, delivers them through the Red Sea, gets them to this place of life. They see his glory on the mountain, right? So much so that there's fire and there's earthquake and there's lightning and there's clouds and they say Moses hey you go up and talk to the Lord because if we do we're gonna die that they see like the witness of God and they after a couple days they're like you know what we're gonna go back to like you know the golden calf we're gonna go to we're gonna turn to another God the reason is because they didn't think they were turning to another God here's what they say Exodus 32 verse 2 and following it says Aaron said have your wives and sons and daughters take off their golden earrings they're wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron, who accepted their offering, and fashioning this gold with a graving tool, made a molten calf. Then they cried out, here's the line, then they cried out, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You notice what they're, what they're saying? They're not, they, in their mind, they're not turning away from the God who saved them. What they're, do, what they're doing is they're saying, there's a God who saves us, who saved us? This is him. They're not turning away from God to other things. They're turning God into another thing. And that's the first thing, is turn, treating God like a toy. How many of us are tempted on a regular basis, on a completely normal basis, those of us who love the Lord God are tempted to treat him like a toy? What do I mean by a toy? What I mean by a toy is like the golden calf. What you can do with a golden calf, it's awesome. When you want the golden calf to be close to you, you go over to the golden calf, take him out, put him in your midst. Golden calf, golden calf, golden calf. When you're done, put him back. It's what we do with toys. When you want to play with the Barbie, take the Barbie out of the box. When you're done playing with the Barbie, put the Barbie back in the box. It is an on again, off again, off again kind of a situation. And this is one of the things that, man, how often do we try to control God? How often do we try to control God? That song we sang before the last song we sang, the middle song we sang, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It said something about negotiation. How many times do we approach God with an eye and mind to negotiation? Okay, God, here's the deal. Here's my prayer. I'm going to do this, this, and this. You're going to do that, that, and that. I'm doing it humbly. Lord, please, if I do this, this, and this, would you please do that, that, and that? How often do we come before the Lord and present our resume? Never? Sorry, you guys got quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> How often do we present God with our resume? It's like, okay, God, um, here are all the reasons why you should listen to me. And it doesn't even mean that we're being jerky. We're not being mean. We're not trying to be like, we might not even think we're being manipulative. But we're trading a relationship for a manipulationship. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm, mm. Oh, oh, mm, yeah. <laughs> but that's what it is. I mean, how often do we approach God, not in a relationship, as sons and daughters with our father, but as a manipulation, as a negotiation, as I'm going to present him with my resume. Because why? Because he's kind of the toy. He's the toy that I get to negotiate with. He's that, that, that God that if I want him close, he's close. And if I don't, he doesn't have to be that close. We, God, we could treat God like a golden calf. Even the God of the universe who abides in a golden tabernacle. You know, the people of Israel, I think Jeremiah was the prophet who said, listen, people of Israel, how long, how long will you go on saying, this is the temple of God, the temple of God, the temple of God? You know, because God's presence dwelt in the temple. Remember his glory hovered over the temple? That you could see the, 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 the Shekinah cloud, right? You could see the glory cloud over the temple. And so here's the people of Israel who are saying like, yeah, we're unfaithful and we don't really care about God. When we want him, we go to the temple. When we don't, we go away from the temple. And also, Look at the temple. This, this is the temple of God. This is the temple of God. This is the temple of God. And what do we do as Catholics? We're content being unfaithful. Well, we have the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. This is the presence of God. This is the presence of God. This is the presence of God. And we're treating God like a toy. You're like, not, never the Eucharist. Okay, hopefully not you. But I know it's one of our temptations. 
treat the Eucharist, the very presence of Jesus Christ, as a toy. When I want to be close to him, I go there. When I don't, I don't. So sometimes we treat God as a toy. It's one of the ways, one of the subtle idols in our lives. Even the real God. Get 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 what I'm saying? Like, this is the real God. We're not talking about a fake God. We're talking about the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist that has now become for me a toy. The other one is we treat God like a talisman. Or what am I maybe a talisman? Well, um, kind of like a good luck charm. Another way you can say it is I treat God like my ATM. That, that we, here's, here's the deal. Here's the situation. Kind of like the resume. Kind of like the negotiation. It's um, my vision of God is I approach God. I live a good life. He hears my prayers, gives me good things. So God is kind of in my back pocket as that talisman. God's in my back pocket as that good luck charm. God isn't the center of my life, but he's a really important part of my life so that if I, if I need him, he's, he's basically my parachute. God's my parachute. And this is really fascinating. For, for, I want to go down two roads quick. Uh, the first one is, I find that if we approach God like a talisman, that good luck charm, that ATM, that if God is good, then he's going to give me good things. If God is good, he's going to give me good things. I'm sure you've seen this. Maybe you've seen it in your own heart. or Maybe you've seen it in the lives of your teens, lives of your youth, lives of the people you work with. Is that, yeah, I know God loves me. But then the moment real suffering happens, there's tailspin. It's just I'm out of control. Why? Because, wait a second, I thought you said God was good. I thought you said God loved me. And if he loved me, if he's good, if he's a good, good father, right, then why am I going through this pain? Because in my mind, a good dad doesn't let you go through pain. Does that make sense? How many times have we all seen this happen in our lives, in the lives of our youth? Because it's just so interesting. I wonder if, I, there's so much stuff that goes into this. I think one of the things that goes into it is because in the early church, those who encountered the gospel, they had first encountered the world. I want to say that again. When people encountered the gospel, typically they had first encountered the cross without Jesus on it. In the early proclamation of the gospel, people had already known, they already knew life is difficult. They already knew that life is broken. They already knew that this world is a mess. And then they found out, wait a second, but we're not alone? But wait a second, there's a God who actually has drawn near to us and he's embraced this cross and he's borne it with me and for me so that I don't have to live die in my sins so that actually there's more to this life than just this brokenness, that's great news. But a lot of us, having been raised Christian or raised Catholic, the first message is, thanks be to God, is God loves you. That's not a bad message, by the way. <laughs> first message, life is hard. Um, but our first message has been, God loves you. And God wants your good. Those two things are still true. God loves you and wants your good. And then what happens is then we encounter the cross. A lot of us. A lot of our teens. A lot of my college students. They've heard God loves them. And then they encounter the cross. And all of a sudden it's, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. If God's good and God loves me, then why is there this brokenness? If God's good and God loves me, then why is there this suffering? If God's good and God loves me, then why is there a cross here? And so then we fall away. Because God was supposed to be my talisman. God was supposed to be my good luck charm. God was supposed to be the ATM who bailed me. Out. Another way to say it is, you know, we have this problem. And I always say that when we encounter this problem, I blame parents. <laughs> I thought it was funnier than, I mean, I guess maybe there's a room of a bunch of parents who are like, You can leave now, Father. <laughs> Here's what I mean. When I grew up, when a lot of y'all grew up, um, there's such a thing as latchkey kids. Remember, remember latchkey kids? Like, maybe you were a latchkey kid. Um, so that, what that meant for the, those who youngsters, um, latchkey kid was uh, mom and dad are working, and so when you come up, come up from school, you have a key. So you let yourself in your house, uh, you take care of yourself, and you kind of do your thing because mom and dad are doing their thing. Apparently, the story is that in our culture, those latchkey kids grew up saying, I don't want to be like that. 
I don't want to be like my mom and dad who are never there for me. So I'm going to be there for my kids. That's a good impulse. And so you, but then that gave rise to the, what's known as the helicopter parent. Right? So the helicopter parent, yeah. <laughs> this, this. The helicopter parent is the one who like, my kid's in trouble. <laughs> it lands in there. You know, it's so funny because uh, there is a deacon on our campus. Um, he was the head of housing for 35 years. He said when he first started working in housing, he dealt all the time, he dealt with, with students, with housing issues. He said the last 10, 15 years of working in housing, he never, he rarely dealt with students. He almost always dealt with their parents. That these parents were driving up from the Twin Cities two and a half hours, three hours to meet with them in his office. And he would say, um, why am I not meeting with your son or your daughter? And they'd say, you don't have to meet with them. You're meeting with me. Because that sense of like, here, my son or daughter is in, pro in trouble. I'm here to face the trouble. I'm here to resolve the issue. That's what a good parent does, right? They, you're in pain. They take away the pain. Now, we have a new iteration. We had latchkey kids and we have helicopter parents. There's a new iteration of parents that you probably know about this. I call them Zamboni parents. So... <laughs> In northern Minnesota, in Minnesota, you know, we have ice rinks, hockey rinks, you might have them too. Um, the Zamboni, what's the Zamboni do? The Zamboni goes over the rough ice and makes it all smooth, right? Takes the, takes the ice and just makes it like, no, baby doll, it's okay. Okay, honey child, let's make you all smooth here. So that's, so there's not going to be rough, there's not going to be rough ice for you. I'm going to go ahead of you and we're going to pave the way and it's going to be, it's going to be smooth sailing. Now, both the helicopter parent and the Zamboni parent. I, okay, um, confession. If I were a biological parent, 100%, I would, be, I would be a Zamboni parent. Like, even with my nieces and nephews, like, I'm like, I'm, how can I sol <laughs> gonna solve all your problems? Like, how can I spare you anything? I would dress them up with helmets, elbow pads, full body armor every single day. Like, I am no better. Yeah, I would be that way. But here's the thing. The problem is, if that's what a good parent does, if a good parent is one where you're suffering, they come to the rescue. If a good parent is one who goes ahead of you and makes things smooth, it takes away every obstacle. But then here I am in the middle of a really difficult life. Because we know this. Life is difficult. This world is broken. You've suffered more than maybe, for more than you deserve, maybe. And if God doesn't take you out of that suffering, doesn't take you away from that pain, then is he really good? Because that's what good parents do, right? They, they take away the pain. Is that who God reveals himself to be in the Bible? Is he the good luck charm? Is he the talisman? Is he the Zamboni parent or the helicopter parent? He reveals that he's not. In fact, he reveals that he is what parents are supposed to be. I remember hearing someone talk about this and say, yeah, to a certain point, parents, your job is to keep your kids safe. To a certain point, your job is to keep your kids safe. But the problem is, you can't make the world safer. The world is broken, and the world is dangerous. And you can't make the world fixed, and you can't make the world safe. So your job as a parent is not to make the world safe, but to make your kids strong. Your job is not to make the world um, less dangerous, but to make your kids courageous. Well, that's the job of a parent. Yes, yes, protect them, you know, keep them away from the stove and the heights and stuff. But after that is to prepare them for this world that will actively try to kill them by making them strong, by making them courageous, by making them brave, by making them willing to face danger, knowing, knowing that as they go out to face danger, they're always loved. This is how the father, I mean, it's how the father reveals his fatherhood, right, with Jesus. The father declares over his son, Jesus Christ, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Before he does anything, before Jesus does anything, he's baptized by John in the Jordan, this is, and, he, and the father claims him, just like, just like the father claims you all. He's not a toy, not a talisman, he's a dad. And he claims you. But then what does he do with the son? He allows his son to enter into his passion. He allows his son to enter into grief. He allows his son to enter into sorrow. He allows his son to enter into death, to be overwhelmed by death. Because his son is dangerous. 
Because the son is strong. Because the strong is the son. Our, our Lord Jesus is courageous. Imagine that. You ever reflect on that? That God himself is courageous? Because you don't need to be courageous if you are the immutable God. <laughs> Invincible, you don't need to be courageous. God humbles himself. He makes himself vulnerable. He makes himself vincible. And then he, be, and he reveals that he's also courageous. Saying, be like me. In this world that is actively trying to kill you, be like me. In this world where suffering is real, be like me. In this world where good people don't always get what they deserve and bad people don't always get what they deserve, be like me. Not treating God like a talisman, but knowing that God is your father. Amen? So we sometimes, the subtle idol, God is a toy. Sometimes the subtle idol, God is a talisman. Sometimes the subtle idol is God is a therapist. God's simply the one who makes me, he's there to make me feel better. Like I come before God with my problems and he's like, oh, there, there, buddy. Cheer up there, buckaroo. So we go into prayer and what happens is like, well, I didn't feel anything. You know, that kind of the sense of like, that God's here to affirm me in my whatever I'm going through. Now this is a, this is a, apparently, I'm not a therapist and I, I've studied a little therapy. I've heard a lot of therapists. One therapist in particular, um, he had shared, he said that, he said affirmation therapy is one thing that's kind of big. Like people come and they say, this is my experience, you're supposed to affirm them. This is my experience, okay, just affirm them in their experience. He's like, that's not a good therapist. And if God was to do that, if he was to simply affirm us as we approached him, that would not be a good God. God, here I'm going through this. And just like, yeah, yeah, it's true. That's rough. That's it. That's it. Kind of as if, it's, as if his only role is to simply offer us comfort and to affirm us in our brokenness. It's not his job. But I can see all the scriptures in which God reveals, I care for you. I am the, com I mean, the Holy Spirit, the comforter. That, that I delight in you. That I treasure you. We can hear those scriptures and say, well, that must mean then that God simply is here to comfort me, simply here to comfort me. That he's simply here to affirm me. And if he doesn't, then maybe I shouldn't give him my heart. See, that, that's, the, that's the problem with the idols. It's just like at the beginning of this, we talked about how the big answer, the big question, and the big answer is, does God have permission to love you as you are? The flip side of that is, are you willing to love God as he is? As he's actually revealed himself to be. So toy, talisman, therapist, and twin. Twin is interesting. They're all interesting. I think twin is exceptionally interesting. Why? Because oftentimes, when I say we make God our twin, what I mean is, I've made God in my image and likeness. So what's that mean? It means God likes what I like. God thinks the way I think. God affirms what I affirm, kind of like the therapist. God dislikes what I dislike. God prefers what I prefer. And what we can simply do is, is we can create our own version of God. So the version of God that I approach is not really Jesus. He's my version, my, my flavor of Jesus that I, my flavor of God that I just simply named Jesus. Does that make sense? Now, I found this. <laughs> I find this in my life so uh, horribly. It's just the worst. I find it especially when it comes to my own opinions. I've heard it said that opinions are like noses. Everyone has them and they all smell. There's a PG-13 version of that as well that I'm not going to say from here. But I find that when I think if God holds my opinion, I have to wonder in whose image we're dealing with. Is it I'm in God's image or he's in my image? There was a great book by Philip Yancey years ago I read called uh, What's So Amazing About Grace? And at one point, he tells the story of this baseball player and who was a Christian. And uh, 
baseball player was asked the question by one of his, the interviewers and said, okay, if Jesus was playing baseball and he was running from third to home and the catcher had the ball, would he take the out, you know, get tagged out, or would he, you know, run into the catcher and try to knock the ball loose? And the professional baseball player, who's also Christian, said, well, I think Jesus would play fair, but he'd also play to win. He'd probably go to knock the ball out. And Philip Yancey pointed this out. He said, I was listening to this man talk, and I was like, um, I think that's what you would do. <laughs> I don't even know if Jesus would be playing baseball. <laughs> In fact, I think, like me, he'd be a swimmer, because he'd win every race. I mean, he'd just, like, w run across the top. You know, you wouldn't even have to, like, dive in. <laughs> he'd just, like... But that's the thing is, how often do we find that Jesus' opinions of politics are our opinions of politics? That Jesus' view of pick your issue, I don't even want to name any because all of a sudden I'll be killed, um, is my opinion of that issue. We have this trap because these are the subtle idols we have. God's our toy, God's our talisman, God's our therapist, God's my twin. So how do we break free of this? There's three ways. How do we break free of this? Um, the first is, as I, as I mentioned, um, Oh, but by the way, does that make sense, kind of? Okay, good. I was like, nope, Father, you're just wasted your t our time. First thing is surrender. I, I said this is going to be the answer, right? The first thing is surrender. And what I mean by surrender is um, basically saying, okay, God, you get my heart. God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to let go. I, 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 give, I surrender my will to yours. Uh, what you reveal yourself, to, it's, it's that same thing as like, God, I give you permission to love me as I am. And... I strive to love you as you are, as you've actually revealed yourself to, 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 to be. And so the problem with that is um, it means we need to let go of our assumptions. It means we need to let go, let go of our expectations. Problem with that. So when I do marriage prep, one of the things um, we talk about is expectations in marriage. What are you expecting in marriage? And um, a lot of times we have unmet expectations or unfulfilled expectations. How many of you who have married like, hooray, yes, that's my life. Like three of you, great. Okay, so we have these things called unmet expectations in marriage. And I think they come from what I would term uncommunicated assumptions. So a lot of times uncommunicated assumptions lead to unmet expectations. So it's like, I always give the example of like, what do we do with a garbage can? And there's the, uh, the groom was like, why isn't she taking out the garbage? My, my mom would always take out the garbage. Everyone knows that the woman takes out, takes out the garbage. And she's saying, why isn't he taking out the garbage? Everyone, my dad would take out the garbage. That's how he served my mother. Why is he not taking, everyone knows this. Or it's something not gendered, you know, it's maybe something like, you know, the person's making the meal. And they're like, why aren't they taking out the garbage? Everyone knows the person who, one person makes the meal, the other person cleans up after the meal. Everyone knows this. Well, the other person's saying, why aren't they cleaning up after themselves? Everyone knows the person who makes the mess cleans up the mess. Everyone knows these things. The problem with Uncommunicated, uncommunicated assumptions is, I used to ask our couples, like, what are some of your uncommunicated assumptions? And they're like, we don't know. That's the problem. <laughs> because you don't know what your assumptions are until it's like, oh, you don't think the same as I do, I guess. I remember there was a couple. Not only did they have the normal differences between male and female, but she was from northern Minnesota, and he was from Central America. Now, here's something you need to know. In Central America, um, Maybe you know this already. Central America, um, if you're offered something, the answer is, would you like some of this? The answer is, yes. In Minnesota, would you like this? No, no, no. We, we're under contractual obligation as Minnesotans <laughs> to refuse an offer three times. <laughs> hey, you want something to drink? No, no, I'm good. No, no, seriously, I'm going to get something to drink. You want some? No, no, I'm fine. No, I'm going to the kitchen. I'm going to come back with, with some, some pop. You, with some pop. Uh, you want some? Okay, that's called being polite. That's manners. <laughs> so here's this woman from Minnesota who's visiting her future husband's mother, and she's like, would you like some food? No, 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 no. Would you like something to drink? No, 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 no. Would you like this? No, 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 no. And he's like, say yes to my mother. Like, what the heck? What are you, why are you being so rude? She's like, no, I'm not being rude. I'm being the opposite of rude. Why? Because you have assumptions. So uncommunicated assumptions lead to unmet expectations. When it comes to the Lord, the same thing can be true. I don't know what I expected God to be. I don't know what I assumed life would be like. And so all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's not how I just assumed it to be. That's when I know. That's when I need to surrender. That make sense? I didn't realize that, okay, following the Lord 
would be like this. Okay, it is like this. I surrender. It's that God, I give you permission to love me as you want to love me. I thought it would be like this, but how it really is, okay, Lord, yes, I, I surrender to this. The problem with the assumptions, we don't know until they're exposed. We don't know until they're revealed. But that brings up another point, which is one of the reasons why we read Scripture. God, you have permission to love me as I am? And he says, okay, now, can you love me as I am? I don't know, can't, I can't tell you how many people uh, wrote to me over the last year, year and a half. Catholics going to Mass every single Sunday who were deeply disturbed by what they heard in the Bible, their Bible. In fact, I remember getting a letter from, from this man. Um, <laughs> the woman I worked with, she was like, I, I got this letter, I don't want to give it to you because it wasn't signed. And now in seminary, they always told us, if there's an unsigned letter, don't read it, just throw it away. And I'm like, I can handle it. Hand it over. I read it, and it was this man who's going through the Bible in a year. And then right before, he's like maybe in date 90s, somewhere in there. And he says, I'm going through it with my parish, and we all hate it. We all can't believe that this is what God is like. So I hear that John's gospel is coming up, and hopefully that'll that'll salvage something, but if not, we're all done. <laughs> and it was like, oh my gosh. Here is God himself, who's like, this is what I'm like. This is my heart. Here's God declaring over us, I love you as you are. Let me love you as you are. But also, are you willing to love me as I am? The thing with surrender to the Lord is I have to know who he is. That's one of the reasons why having a biblical worldview is the solution. Because God knows, not God knows us. Do I know him? Am I willing to let him reveal himself to me as he wants to reveal himself to me through scripture and through the church? Part of the solution to the idols. God gets to reveal his real heart to me, his true heart to me. Because one of the things is the second thing, we're almost there, is that Jesus in the gospels, he says, if you want to be my disciple, three things. Deny yourself, Pick up your cross and just look at that first qualification, first criterion for a disciple. He, Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, deny yourself. Now, it's so fascinating. I always thought this is like perfect for Lent because that's what we do in Lent, right? I'm going to deny myself things. I'm going to deny myself stuff I want. But then I did some reading because um, I had to be able to talk about the Bible a little bit and... Uh, one of the things that, that the commentaries revealed was that when Jesus says deny yourself, he's not saying deny yourself things. He's saying deny yourself, meaning renounce yourself. Disavow your allegiance to yourself. This is deeper, right? This is deeper than chocolate for Lent. This means actually, um, this is in the gospel on Holy Thursday night. We're on the charcoal fire. Simon Peter denies that he knows Jesus. He disavowed any relationship with Jesus. He renounced his relationship with Jesus. And Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciple, you have to disavow yourself. Renounce yourself. Not simply deny yourself things, but deny yourself. Does that make sense? It goes so much deeper, right? That sense of like, What's my primary allegiance? Is my primary allegiance in life to me? Or is my primary allegiance in life to the Lord? The only thing that will kill the idol is if I let God reveal himself to me, right? Biblical worldview. I surrender to him. But then also, I have to renounce, disavow my primary allegiance. Because every one of us has our primary allegiance to ourselves. And we have, you love your family. You love the people that you've committed your life to. That's so good. But that's why Jesus says, if you love mother, father, husband, wife, children more than me, not worthy of me. In fact, he even says, if you love yourself more than me, you're not worthy of me. To kill the idol is to say, okay, I renounce my primary allegiance to myself. My primary allegiance now belongs to the Lord Jesus. Now, this is all, <laughs> this is the last thing, promise. 
This might be all abstract right now, right? How do I surrender? How do I renounce myself? It's very practical, in fact. If you remember, if you remember back in the, in the Old Testament, um, after the kingdom is divided, the 12, 12 tribes, right, united, uh, they get divided to the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. There's Jeroboam, who's that jerky king who establishes kingdom, the 10, 10 tribes in the north. No, he knows something's going to happen. He knows that even though he's the king in the north, king of Israel, the people are going to keep going down to Jerusalem. They're going to keep going down to Judah to worship the Lord God. And he knows if they keep going down to Judah, if they keep going to Jerusalem to worship the Lord God, he's going to lose their hearts. He's going to lose their allegiance. So what does he do? He sets up two different places of worship, in Dan and in Bethel. Sets up a whole new priesthood, a whole new system of worship. Why? Because Jeroboam, even though he's jerky Jeroboam, he knew, he knew, the, he knew the truth about the human heart. What you worship, you love. What we're willing to worship possesses us, holds us, grasps us. Why? Because the heart of worship, this is important, the heart of worship is sacrifice. The heart of worship is sacrifice. So here you are. You'd be going to Jerusalem to worship the Lord God, meaning to sacrifice what matters to you to the Lord God. Making that journey to the Lord God. Offering the lamb to the Lord God. Offering whatever grains you had to the Lord God. And your heart would belong to him because your stuff belonged to him. You sacrifice stuff. So instead, you know what we're going to do? Set up a place of worship in Dan and in Bethel, and you're going to give your stuff to this false god, to this idol. And what's going to happen, even if you don't want it to happen, is that idol will hold your heart, will own your heart, will possess your heart. And this is true for all of us. If we want to kill idolatry in our hearts, we want to make sure that God doesn't have a rival in our hearts, Yes, we surrender, meaning just we just say, you don't even have to like feel it, just say, okay, God, my heart is yours. Perfect, great. Number two, we have a biblical worldview where we deny ourselves, have our primary allegiance to the Lord Jesus. But the third thing is, we regularly worship the Lord God, meaning we sacrifice. What do we mean to sacrifice? Not only mass, obviously. But there's three areas of our lives that matter the most to us, and they reveal what we love. Our time our money, and our entertainment. I'll say it like this. I always, I got this from Focus, and I love it. I fellowship of Catholic University students. It was the line of, what's the mark of a disciple? A disciple is someone who's willing to change their schedule to get closer to Jesus. A disciple is someone who is willing to change their schedule to get closer to Jesus. If I sacrifice my time for the Lord Jesus, man, he's going to have your heart. Don't worry. Don't worry if you feel it or not. He's going to have your heart. Sacrifice your time. And if I don't sacrifice my time to follow Jesus, not only am I not a disciple, he will never have my heart. Please sit with that. If I don't, regularly, not perfectly, but regularly sacrifice, my, change my schedule to get closer to Jesus, not only will I not be a disciple of Jesus, he will never get access to my heart. Number two, my stuff. And I'm not saying, so therefore, it's called bull.catholic.org, so you can donate to UMD, campus ministry. Like, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is at some point, I have to actually, my checkbook reveals what I love. My checkbook reveals who has or what has my heart. So my calendar reveals my heart. My checkbook reveals my heart. And lastly, I said entertainment, but what I basically mean is what we consume. What I consume has my heart. That whether the entertainment I consume, the food I consume, the alcohol I consume, the, the, uh, what I do with my free time. These three things, because I'm giving myself to those things, those three things will either kill the subtle idols in our lives or they'll feed the subtle idols in our lives. And if you and I want to be the kind of people who belong truly and fully to the Lord Jesus, that means not only do we surrender to him saying, okay, Lord, 
You have access. We let him be him. We deny ourselves. Our primary allegiance belongs to him. But also, in a practical way, my calendar reflects the fact that Jesus is the one I live for. My checkbook reflects the fact that Jesus is the one I live for. My entertainment choices, my food choices, my drinking choices reflect that Jesus is the one I live for. Because he's one who lives and loves you. You know, so many lies and so many subtle idols in our lives. But the Lord God who loves us, he loves us with a crazy love, like where he loves us, who like in so many ways we don't deserve his love. It's one of the reasons why, like what, what, when, God, when God loves us, what does he do? He places himself, him, he places himself in our hands. That's pretty crazy. He places himself on our tongue. That's pretty crazy. God becomes a baby. That from the first moment we even knew he existed, we tried to kill him. From the first moment people in Nazareth found out that maybe he's the one who says he is, tried to kill him. Comes into Jerusalem, reveals, I'm the great I am. And what do we do? We tried to kill him. That kind of love is crazy. That kind of love is reckless. That kind of love is, is dangerous. That's the, kind of, that's the kind of God that we serve. That's the kind of God who loves you with a reckless, ridiculous, absurd love. And that's the, kind of lo- that's the kind of God that we get to worship tonight. That's the kind of God who loves us like this. It's the kind of God who loves us by becoming so humble that he lets us pass by him in the tabernacle and not even notice. He lets us casually approach him in the Eucharist and not even not even blink. But he says, I love you as you are. That's reckless. And that crazy and ridiculous and reckless love is the kind that just wants to tear down every idol in our hearts. That kind of crazy and ridiculous and reckless love is the one that kind of wants to stomp over, over every lie that has approached our hearts. And that crazy and ridiculous and reckless love is the kind that just says, I'm willing to love you as you are. And ask the question, are you willing to love me as I am?